Hello, and welcome to Once More with Feeling. I'm your host, Edmund Scrimmins, and joining me for the fourth time, I believe. Yes, yes. Hello again. We have met before, and we'll probably meet again, because I'm purely heritage. Yeah. I, I think at the rate we're going, you're going to be the main guest presenter. Well, I mean, there's other people around. I just happen to be available at the right time, I guess. Also, you're one of the few people who actually responds when I try to sort out things. I don't actually you know, listen to new music quite regularly. Yeah. yeah. Also, it helps that you actually know who we're talking about this time round, so... I think most people will, to be fair. Yeah. Um, actually, you should probably say, um, yeah, this week we'll be talking about uh, the new Faith No More album, uh, Soul Invictus. Which translates to Unconquered Sun, which is kind of appropriate when you hear about what some of the songs are like. Um, but yeah, first off, do the usual bout of what we've been listening to. So, yeah, what have you been listening to recently? Me? Um, the usual variety of pretty much anything I can get my hands on, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I should be listening to a bunch of remix Jojo Bizarre Entry music. Was pretty amusing. Mm-hmm. Um, went to uh, Pasadena Moon Moon live in London recently, so a bunch of their stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, got a new Mogwai album the other day, always more post rock. A lot of post rock in general, made a lot of Rosetta recently as well. Mm-hmm. And of course, New California single came out last week, so listen to that a lot. Mm-hmm. As usual, because I'm a gigantic fanboy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I can't really say much on being a massive fanboy, can I? No, you really can't. Well, since, since the last time we did this, haven't you, you know, seen Devin live again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there would have been a show on that, but no one was available. Well, this was, you know, I couldn't go, and everyone else that could go isn't available very often. Yeah. I wish I was there, but I was not. Yeah. Um, yeah, Devin Townsend did a live show of the second Ziltoid album, which was pretty cool. I would have liked to have seen more stuff done, but constraints of a budget and all that sort of thing. You know, metal is not the most lucrative of genres. Unless you're like super popular, which you probably aren't, unless you're like Metallica or somebody. Hmm. But then you have Lars just being a dick, so. Yeah. Even most Metallica fans agree that Lars is a bit of a dick, so. I, I don't think there's any Metallica fans who won't say Lars is a bit of a dick. <laughs> kind of, you know, basic concept about being with Tiger fan is to agree with that, so... Yeah. Of course, when... I, I remember at one point, he sort of, like, the lineup basically ended up as the Cowardly Lion, Gollum, Inigo Montoya from The Princess <laughs> Bride, and, like, Mexican Hulk Hogan, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to Mexican Hulk Hogan, this guy. I don't know, yes, did he just... It's a Bessels! A Bessels Super Slam Suplex! <laughs> Even though I don't think... I don't think Hulk Hogan has ever done a suplex! Yeah, but it's the one wrestling move that everyone recognises the name of. Yeah. Very popular Pile Driver. Of course. It's quite funny that Pile Drivers are semi-not legal anymore. Because <laughs> um, one wrestler accidentally broke the neck of a couple of other wrestlers whilst doing a pile driver. It's not particularly helpful for you know, health reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess I'm probably getting a suit for that. And um, mm. also the good action and all that kind of crap. Yeah. I just wanted to come out and say, oh, we're going to sue you for this wrestling move. Um, what do you have to say in your defence? It's not real. <laughs> uh, Ramp for another time, but there is a distinction between it not being real and it being staged. I know, this is is the one common phrase that's thrown around a lot. Yeah, which is rather funny because it's sort of like, you like action films, they're far less real. Most mediums are a lot less real. Yeah. So. I mean, at least wrestling, it is the wrestlers doing the stunts. Yeah, they're different to watching like Jackass or something, I guess. Oh god, Jack. We're a little bit less stupid. <laughs> anyway, we're getting kind of distracted already. 
That's... Look at what's more with wrestling. <laughs> that has to be a record. Started so quickly. Yeah. We didn't even get six minutes into the show and already we got distracted. <laughs> yeah, where were we? Yeah. What have you been listening to then, other than Team Devin Times and Life? Um, it's generally been sort of like, well, going through the Faith No More album a fair few times just to get the proper feel of it. Um, also just, of course, what's annoying is what it's got as in my recently played list it's not what's recently played it's rather ridiculous how did you even manage that? I don't know uh, but yeah my, it's generally been a case of my playlist being on random and me just letting it play ended up with random guar and um, Tiger Lily songs and well, we can't really argue with that I mean this is good stuff not like you're having a nickel back when they get you had to say it. Of course I did. <laughs> Although I will give them this. There is one song. One song that I can say is actually good of theirs. Uh? Um, Never Again. I don't think I've heard it. Because I'm going to be Yeah. But it, it's like... It's one of those cases of every band has to have at least one good song. You know, like... um. My Chemical Romance has Teenagers as their one good song. Fall Out Boy has My Songs Know What You Did in the Dark. It's some sort of crappy title like that. Well, where's the good song in Broken Side, eh? <laughs> There's always an exception that proves the rule. Or well, a decent Nightcore song, so don't exist. Nightcore? Uh, especially taking regular songs, pitch shifting everything up, and speeding up a little bit, and then deciding to sell it as music. How is that even a thing? I don't know, but it's everywhere and it's terrible, and they put every single song I do it to, it ruins it completely. I, I don't like it, I don't know why. I, I, I don't get how that could ever be a thing. Neither do I, but it's a popular thing, it seems, and it scares me. Uh, kids these days. Well, the only person I've ever known who's actually listened to it was, you know, a 16-year-old nerd, so probably it's not possible. <laughs> the youngins these days, they don't know true music! Like we've been more, who have been going since before they were born. Mm. Actually, that's... <laughs> I think to save us tangenting too much... Seriously, how is it a thing? I don't know. Just... I don't. All I know is it's around, it's on YouTube, it's keeping recommended to me because it happens to be something relatively similar to the thing I'm listening to, it's like broken. Ah. Uh. It's like, you would like this song, maybe you would like this version that's been just fucked in the ass, and then there you go. <laughs> of course, one thing I've found is uh, there seem to be all these genres that pop up, and you just go, how is this a thing? How, how has this come into existence? Like, Deathcore. I can kind of understand the concept behind Deathcore. I don't know why it became a thing, but I can kind of... Wonder, well, I kind of understand why, but I don't know why I ever wanted to. Yeah. I, I mean... Oh, God. I have seen a few Deathcore bands live, and it's sort of like, Oh, God, I think my brain is melting. Like, um, I've seen Job for a Cowboy live. Oh, dear. They were supporting Megadeth. It wasn't by choice. Wow, that's that's really sad for Megadeth to have that kind of support in it. Yeah. It's like me watching Iron Maiden live and having a Vince Seven on the support. Ugh. Wait, that happened? Yeah, it did, I was there. <laughs> um, I've also seen Black Dahlia murder. Sometimes? They yeah. were at Bloodstock and it was on the same day as Alice Cooper was headlining, so... It was basically a case of, nope, not moving! <laughs> you had to get to a good position. But I haven't sit through this crappy ass band, but... It was either that day or the day Iced Earth was playing. It was the same weekend, so... You can understand why I'm a bit uncertain which day it was. Yeah, I can imagine. It's like when I went to uh, Glastonbury, I went to see Bjork, and I had nothing to do with the arcade fire for half an hour. <laughs> Actually, I think it was the same day as Alice Cooper, because I think... It was a case of Paradise Lost, Dimmu Borgir, and Alice Cooper all in one row. That was pretty enjoyable to me. Yeah. 
don't think I've seen Paradise Lost, actually. They're one of those bands who, when I saw them, they were really great live, but the first time Callum saw them, they were a bit... Um, the lead singer's attitude was not up to snuff. Yeah, fair. They were having, bad day, Yeah. I mean, I think it is very much a... It heavily depends on how good a day in general they're having, which is kind of ironic for a goth band. <laughs> this is true. But yeah, this, my day's been awful. Sure is nice to be a goth. <laughs> oh, that just reminds me of um, the Now Show uh, Radio 4 satire programme where um, they do audience questions and it was something like what disappoints you? And uh, one of the responses was nothing. Why? I am a goth. I know that everything will turn out terrible. <laughs> that is pretty good. I mean, that sounds like s- sort of a time-travelling me-type response. Yeah, it's kind of one of the things you have to be, you know, you just think, this is the perfect moment to respond with this perfect opportunity, and if we miss it now, you're not going to get home to it again. Yeah. <laughs> um, already we're off to a very peculiar start. Well, at least we are talking about music, which is you know, the point of the show after all. Yeah. yeah. Quite the white music, but hey. Well. It's not kind of genre. Well, we might as well go into the album. We've already been talking for almost 15 minutes. Uh, I think it's actually probably less time than quite a lot of our episodes to actually get onto topic. Yeah. Uh, I think if we're to make this in any way successful, we kind of need to start cutting down a bit. Probably a good idea. Yeah. But, um, yeah, uh, so this album, I have to say I'm glad it came out because I've been a fan of Faith No More for quite a few years now, but that was during the long time that they weren't together anymore. Well, it was quite a long period there, yeah, nothing much interest coming out. I was like, oh, well, they did a few albums decades ago, and then just nothing. Yeah, I mean, the last album, I mean, they they had a tour, and it was basically a case of that tour was so successful that they went, fuck it, let's release an album. It's good to be kind of pessimistic about it, thinking, hmm, this, it's been so long, can they, have they still got it? Are they going to release anything decent, or will it just be kind of a mess? Mm. <laughs> Chinese democracy. <laughs> oh God! But no, it turned out pretty damn good, I'd say. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It's. Oh God. <laughs> you say about Chinese democracy? It's actually been longer for Faith No More. Well, this in this case it was more nothing than we're going to tour, we're going to make an album, rather than we're going to make an album in like fourteen years' time. Yeah. The last album came out in ninety eight. Well, it's quite a big gap. Yeah. But, yeah, th- this album, I listened to a review of it um, before getting it myself, and the review that I listened to was basic, it was basically a case of, I'm liking what I'm hearing, let's see what it's like. I always try to check out a few reviews before I do anything, I was thinking, hmm, these people liked it, these people didn't like it, this is the problems, these are the good bits, and, okay, fair enough, I'll go in with open mind, knowing what to expect, or kind of what to expect. Mm. And see where it goes from there. Yeah. Um, it's completely terrible reviews across the board, then I'm probably like to give it a shot. Mm. Yeah, it's it's definitely one of those albums that's the best way to describe it is multifaceted. Wasn't it eclectic actually put that way? Mm. Eclectic, multifaceted, whatever. Um, the production uh, this is something I cannot praise enough for any band considering the uh, abysmal production we've had from some albums. <coughs> Death Magnetic. You can back the again, yeah. Um, I used to like that album. Well, I think it's not a particularly bad album, I guess. It's just the fact that the production quality is so terrible that you can't really hear anything for it. Yeah, but the production quality on this album is absolutely superb. Mm, I agree with that. It's, it sounds fantastic, and if, even like 10, 20 years in the future, it will sound just as good, I reckon. Yeah, because it's one of those cases where you can pick out every single instrument, and you can tell where all the different contributions are coming from. It's always nice. Yeah, it was definitely... It kind of felt like they were hailing back to 
Well, Mike Patton was hailing back to um, his Mr. Bungle time because the very eclectic nature of the album kind of brought to mind how Mr. Bungle would variate between lots of different genres at once. I guess it's probably the kind of fact that they're thinking, hmm, we need a new album, it's been so long, we want to do something that kind of covers all the bases across our careers so far, mm. whilst being a still kind of what's what, uh, consistent enough yeah. to be able to recognise the wire as they are. Yeah. I mean, if if you've listened to anything like Tomahawk or um, Phantomass, you'll notice that um, they've kind of picked bits from those careers as well, and um, huh, just looking through the associated acts, and it's sort of, you can certainly tell where influences have come from, like uh, Dillinger Escape Plan and things like that. Mm, yeah. But yeah, it's. I think this is one of those cases where we kind of need to go through it song by song to really give people an idea of what the album is like. I suppose a lot of stuff sounds quite a bit different to other stuff. Yeah. So we got a lot of little mini albums. Hmm. BB albums. So, start off with the title track, which, for once, it's actually the first track on the album! And not just a random intro, yeah. It's kind yeah. of an intro, but also kind of a song at the same time, so... Yeah, I mean, Soul Invictus has a very... Uh, I'm not sure how to describe it. So it's a very, um... Odd. <laughs> quite meditative song, I think. I, quite, I think the vocals do feel part of some part of that. It's a very strange kind of vocal effect to it, on there, which I really like. Yeah, and it, it's a sort of song that, when it starts playing, you kind of have to stop and just listen to it. It really kind of does that. Like it grabs your attention and makes you want to carry on listening to the album. I suppose as a first opening track, it's probably the best thing for it. It's like, hey, check this out. This is really, really interesting. You, you can sit down and you can just ignore everything else and listen to this awesome album. Yeah, and... Um, I think that's one of the things that is missing from a lot of albums these days. You don't have that, you've got to just stop and listen to this album. Yeah, a lot of albums are like, oh look, here's a really, really main big hit song here that, you know, you've heard on the radio 500,000 times. You can ignore the rest because it probably isn't very good. Mm. <coughs> Nickelback. <laughs> This case is kind of like, yes, this is our opening song, this is what we're like, or well, maybe not, because the rest of the songs are different, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, check it out. Yeah, um, and then you've got Superhero. I really like Superhero, actually, yeah, I, think, I think it's one of my favourite songs on the album, it's kind of like a hard rock kind of sound to it. Yeah, and it's... The lyrics are interesting as well. Because, mm. you know, from the title Superhero, you'd initially think that it's sort of like a lot of bands do, the lead singer or the band declaring themselves to be superheroes, but it feels much more like a mocking sort of a very dark satirical opinion of the whole ideology of superheroes. Very much so. It's kind of saying these are superheroes. Are they really that great? Mm. I mean, you may think that them are doing like great acts here and there, but they're actually, you know, they've got their faults. Yeah, and it also feels like. It's saying, it's calling out people who kind of put, um, say, you know, way back when everyone had Obama on this huge pedestal, like he was going to save the world and all that sort of thing. And it's basically, call it feels like it's calling people out on their hypocrisy over that sort of thing. It's kind of also the fact that it's like saying, essentially, oh yeah, these are people like, they're superheroes, they're revered everywhere, they're all around, everyone loves them, but really they you know, they aren't that great they're yeah. giving into the hype yeah they may seem imperfect but they really aren't mm. um sunny side up that's a weird track it is kind of odd I, I like it though yeah but kind of um I don't know what to think of it this is again the lyric very very strange I, mean, I suppose you can split this from my pattern it, it kind of has it almost has the demented optimism of um, something like uh, Float On by, um, is it Modest Mouse? Uh, yes, it would be. Yeah. It's all... I don't think of anyway. Yeah. I mean, there is another song called Float On, but that's very different. <laughs> that's like a 70s or 80s pop jazz kind of thing, or pop soul, something like that. It seems to me that Modest Mouse has kind of got some kind of inspiration from Faith and More, especially with regards to lyrical content. Yeah, so it kind of makes sense that it would all go full circle. Yeah. But yeah, Sunny Side Up, it just feels like a very sort of 
biting. Her biting pig. <laughs> You're despicable. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it just feels like one of those kind of optimistic, but not really songs. Which sounds like Pay No More to me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just look at the same side of the lyric. Just one sequence. Like, Rainbows will bend for me, curvy, honeybees will sting for me, stingy, stingy. But these lyrics. Though that definitely feels like Mr. Bungle influence. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was kind of pointing it out. out as well. Mr. Bungle has always been a bit odd, to say the least. Yeah, or was. I really wish. Oh, oh. I really wish Mike Patton would reunite them. Just well, after this, it could happen at some point, I guess. Because they're not quite well it out. Mm. It depends. I mean, the problem Mr. Bungle has is it's because it's such a niche band. It's not that commercially viable. It's not like Faith No More, where say what you like, they're still a rock band and they can still do things that get in the charts and all that sort of thing. This is a name that's very well known. Yeah. I mean, oh. even if you don't know much about Faith No More, you've probably heard at least things like um, Epic and We Care A Lot. Mm, if you haven't actually heard the song, you've probably at least heard the name for it right about. Yeah, if you've been unfortunate enough to experience Biodome, quite a few of their songs turn up in that soundtrack. It's the one good thing I can say about Biodome, it has a great soundtrack, but that's so... also the worst thing about it. <laughs> You're wasting a good soundtrack on something terrible. Yeah, but yeah. Um, then you've got separation anxiety. Something kind of sounds like it's final. Yeah. It's kind of the anxious kind of sound of something could quite easily go wrong any second now. Yeah, I mean. Kind of just mental. Uh, what the hell's going on? I don't know what's going on now. I mean, the vocal work very much feels like sort of a panicked voice. You know. It, yeah, the kind of panicked voice plus the kind of rapid beat to it as well. Yeah. It, it, sounds of, like, it sounds like an uh, audible version of a panic attack. Yeah. I mean, it feels like it's sort of sung hyperventilation, if that makes sense. Yeah, that can make sense. Yeah. I personally think it's... Whilst it, it's, this might be a bit odd to say, it's not my favourite song on the album, but I do think it's the best in terms of composition. Well, that seems pretty regular. A lot of people do that. Kind of like, yeah, so I really like this song, but this one is just generally better, I think. Yeah. You can kind of appreciate how well made it is you know, if it isn't a personal favourite. Mm. But I think everything just comes together in separation ag anxiety, you know. What I was saying earlier about being able to hear all the different instruments. Mm. There's a lot of plot in here because there's a lot going on. Yeah. Which once again, I think, think fits with the theme of the song. Yeah. Like, oh, there's too much going on, I can't control all this. Mm. And I think that's what really sets not just this song, but the album apart. The fact that all the songs feel like what they're talking about. You yeah, know. Like thematics, as a, also a thematic connections, I guess, between the lyrics and the actual composition. Yeah. It feels like every drum beat, every guitar pluck was basically focused around making it sound exactly like the lyrics. Hmm. And the only other song that comes to mind immediately when I think of that is a similar theme actually, is uh, Panic Attack by Dream Theater. Mm -hmm. Which kind of has the same kind of rapid pace to it and vocal delivery that makes you think, you know, it feels like a panic attack when you listen to it. Mm. I have to look into that one. It's one of their much faster paced songs. I think it's one of their better. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, Dream Theater always felt a bit kind of wishy for me. Yeah. And some of the stuff I really like, other stuff just kind of falls flat for me. But it's one of their best songs, I'd say. Yeah. Well, the problem with Dream Theater is a lot of their songs are kind of samey. Mm, I think it's a kind of, I like a lot too much on, you know, proving how good they are musically rather than actually putting things together. Yeah. But it's other stuff. I think when the writing is done properly in Dream Theater, they can actually be pretty damn amazing. Mm. A lot of the time, it kind of just they kind of show off a bit rather than actually bring everything together. It seems to be a bit overlong sometimes. Mm. Oh god! Hopefully the recording won't pick up. The ice cream truck is right outside. <laughs> is it Satan's ice cream truck? <laughs> there we go. I can hear it. <laughs> yeah, I think the recording is going to pick that up. Hold oh, actual music. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can call that actual music. Well, it's, it's a jingle. It kind of counts. Does it, though? 
would you call it if it was, you know, what do you call that if it isn't music? Um, Other than tasty. The anal tootings of Satan's butt crack. But it comes with nice, delicious cream. Anyway. <laughs> um, Cone of Shame. There we are. Probably my personal favourite song on the album, I'd say. Mm-hmm. It's kind of good. You kind of have a build up to it, which I really like. It yeah. starts out, and then it kind of just kind of builds up over time. And for the chorus, it's kind of it's really kind of complex and heavy. And I really like it. Mm. I think that's we get back to what sets the album apart is sort of, and particular songs is songs like Cone of Shame have this build up and same with Separation Anxiety in fact that there's this very gradual but you can feel an explosion about to come and unlike a lot of songs which you feel a build up to an explosion and then it just peters out I've had that feeling a lot of songs do that they like it's like um, the album version of Outlaw Torn. You you have this build up, and you're expecting this really amazing solo, which weirdly enough does turn up in the symphony version of it. But not in the album version. Yeah, and you're sort of like, I'd only ever heard the symphony version. So when it didn't have the solo, I was sort of like, wait, what? What? No, come on! Give me my solo! <laughs> but yeah, I've had that, as it being a fan of post rock, post metal, and style stuff, mm. it's all about build ups. Mm. Eventually, kind of just getting building, 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 and then there's an explosion right at the end. Yeah. But we've had that kind of build up to something, you think, oh, this is going to be amazing, and then it just cuts out. I was like, well, that was disappointing. Yeah. But, it's kind of shame, but then it's like, you know, what, four minutes long or so? Or four and a half. Um, it manages to get a nice kind of, kind of build up there, and eventually kind of, since the chorus hits in, it kind of slams you in the face. Mm. <laughs> uh, four minutes forty. So, yeah. But yeah, it's what I really enjoyed about the album is how every song feels like it's got a purpose. Yeah. And that cone of shame, particularly, feels like it's got a purpose. I am admittedly having a bit of a dirt moment. Um, <laughs> just a sec. I'm just going to pause things for a moment. Sorry about that. Just needed to rejig my memory. Um, so yeah, uh, something I've been forgetting to say. Uh, Cone of Shame really makes me think of sort of bands like Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. It puts me in mind of quite a bit. So sort of the first half of the song. I think the vocal delivery helps that as well. It's got a very Nick Cave style of voice in the part. Yeah. And then the latter half of the song feels very much sort of Electric Six style. It's sort of a big shift there, but it works. So. Yeah. There's sort of kind of two different halves to it, but it flows nicely between two of them. So. Mm. Then we have Rise of the Fall. Uh, it's hard to pin down, really. Yeah, it's quite an interesting track. I mean, I think the problem I have as an album as a whole is after Cone of Shame, it kind of loses way a little bit, I think. Yeah. Because between Cone of Shame and the eighth track, or Cone of Shame being the fifth, it kind of, I don't really recall those two songs that much. Mm. not bad songs, it just kind of doesn't have the kind of same impact the rest of the album has. Yeah. I mean, Rise of the Fall, I think it could have done with possibly being earlier on the album. There's a discussion we've had before about having albums in a certain order makes them feel a bit different. Like sometimes you look at an album and think, this song should really be here instead. Yeah, because with a title like Rise of the Fall, it it feels much more like it should be an early on song. It sort of acts as a bit of a mission statement, because this whole album definitely feels like it's got a very particular statement in mind quite a political one from well the way I'm reading it at least I think it's kind of the song it was, I must admit out of all the songs it feels you know it wasn't quite what's the word um, it feels quite different to what Fifth and More done before like, it, it stands out as being a bit different to the usual Ben Star yeah a lot of Ben Stars because Fifth and More and my patterns in general but it sounds like something kind of new I guess yeah him, at least. although it does kind of feel a bit more it's quite strange because this wasn't one of the um, singles released and yet it feels more like it would have been the sort of thing to release as a single, you know, to try and get chart topping and all that sort of thing. 
Hmm, yeah, I can kind of see that, I guess. I mean, it's kind of aiming for a slightly different audience, I guess. Yeah. Which well, it could work, I guess. Yeah. I, guess I, I guess, I don't know why. But uh, anyway, <laughs> it does. I suppose it's there to kind of just make it even more varied. Mm. It's not a bad song, it's just a bit less impactful than the rest of the album. Mm. Much like. Right, yeah. As I mentioned it earlier, it just doesn't really stick with me as much as the other songs do. Yeah, much like um, Black Friday, the next song. Uh, uh, Honestly, I really cannot remember this song. <laughs> I listened to the album about an hour ago, and I cannot remember it at all. Yeah, I. Everything else like, sticks in my mind. I can remember parts of it or all of it in a lot of cases. But here, I just completely I lost it entirely. Yeah. Um, Black Friday is, I think, of all the songs, I, I said Rise of the Fall felt a bit more mainstream. Black Friday definitely feels like a mainstream song. Yeah, it has a kind of good, what well, I remember of it anyway. Yeah. It has kind of good structure and style to it, it just, it could have been a lot better, I think. Could have been better implemented. Yeah. Um, they've proven a lot, also in the earlier albums, they've proven that they have stuff that sticks with what's mine and the rest of the album and the whole actually yeah I mean the first five tracks and the last few tracks they stick there and I can remember them I can remember a couple of the lyrics I can remember the structure the guitar the drums everything and yeah it just it's a song that I listen to once but I don't recall any particular part of it yeah I mean part of the reason I've had to re-listen to it is songs like Rise of the Fall and Black Friday just didn't really stick in my mind that well Maybe the rest of the songs are just so good, but... Yeah. I, I, I'd say... I wouldn't say that they're the sort of songs that needed to be cut completely. It's just that their positioning could have been better. I reckon if they moved them around, it could work better. But right now, it's they're stuck between a couple of the best songs on the album. And the songs that stand out a lot more. You know, they think, oh, this is a really, really, really good song. And then these two songs come on, and you're thinking, hmm, this is not as interesting as it could have been. Hmm. Maybe it's a different point, it could have had possibly something that wasn't so good beforehand. So you wouldn't thinking, oh, that's a disappointment after being amazing. It'd mm. be like, it's not bad. Yeah. Um, I think seeing as we we barely have anything to say on Black Friday, we might as well move on. Motherfucker. A very, very fun song. Yeah. I'm not quite sure exactly what it's going on about, but I really enjoy it. So. It's... I'm sure there is underlying themes there that I'm not picking up on. But... Well, um... I sound like a complete idiot right now if I'm not picking up on those. <laughs> well, again, it kind of it feels a bit like it has similar themes to um, superhero, considering the opening lines: "Force fed more than we eat in the wild, grazed on a mash that can suffocate a child." bloated promoted in an ode of pomp style moistened in the feed while we're choked upon the bile I'm not sure if these lyrics are entirely accurate because <laughs> the grammar is all fucked up here but then again, this is my pattern we're talking about here yeah but there's weird grammar and then there's it saying <laughs> moistened in the feed while we choke upon the bile mm, that's a little bit odd yeah but whatever <laughs> A very, very catchy chorus, which I love. Yeah. Well, it's... it's... The motherfucker on the phone. <laughs> he kind of just kind of has a nice balance between being very much racing more kind of style, being quite complex as a song, but also having kind of the catchiness of one of the music. Yeah. It's pretty well, this is a single, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> it was Motherfucker and Superhero that... Huh. Funny that those are the two out... Two songs that got released as singles. Oh, the ones that have similar... Structures and thematics. Yeah. Now yeah, look at the lyrics. I can see what you mean by the, the themes of motherfucker. Yeah. I mean, it's very much. It, it's one of those. It's more complex than you'd initially give it credit for. Hmm. This is, this, the thing is, one thing if you listen to the vocals or uh, the lyrics, a face value doesn't quite have that impact. If you look into it, thinking okay, it actually does have a lot of underlying meaning. Yeah. I mean, this is definitely a sort. Of it's a very political song when you really look at the ly lyrics. Uh, Indeed. I'm I mean, uh, set aside the scruples in a stratagem of strain, a smallpox laden blanket invisible with stains. Yep, that sounds really good to me. Yeah. It's a very good song in how it's. Again, we get to songs building up and building up. And it was that way, well, yeah, I can see the point. Yeah. I can see the kind of same similar structures to Going of Shame. Mm. Uh, 
and it gets more and more intense as it goes along. Yeah, and again, it's the sort of song that makes you just go, Whoa! <laughs> i got to listen to this. And it's my personal favourite. Is that because it has the word motherfucker on it? No, that's just a side benefit. <laughs> It basically means that you can't get in trouble for saying the na- name of the song because it's sort of like, It's called Motherfucker! What do you expect me to do? Bleep my own sentence? <laughs> Have you ever listened to Bleep? Which is getting airplay. I know, I knew a song by Faith No More. Bleep. Uh, it kind of wouldn't work. That's kind of weird. I suppose I could really release it as a single to try and do that kind of thing. Yeah, knowing Faith No More. I mean, considering that um, aggressive or be aggressive even, was written as a prank on the lead singer. <laughs> this, that makes sense. Uh, just give me a sec. He wrote the song largely as a joke at Mike Patton's expense, enjoying the potential humiliation a straight vocalist would subject himself to on the stage. <laughs> and then it became the second most played song at Faith No More concerts. Nice. This is my Patton probably just thought. <laughs> I like your joke, I'm going to play it a lot. I think Mike Patton is one of those singers who it's very difficult to humiliate. He probably just takes it in a stride. Yeah, I can't really think of a circumstance where he'd really be that embarrassed. No, he's just the kind of guy that would just, you know, you know, completely ignore things or just laugh along with it. Yeah. He's going to take a joke. Mm. Um, oh, Matador. Possibly my second favourite song on the album. Mm. It's like chorus, just rising and killing floor like a matador. Yeah. It's, it's, quite, just, it's quite funny. In a way, this is actually the song that feels like it's singing about actual superheroes. Well, I mean, maybe matadors are superheroes. So my part, you know, thinking, oh, there's people you know, dodging balls because they can. And then killing them so that they can be eaten. I'm not even whilst, kidding there. Whilst wearing awesome capes. No, not like superheroes. No capes. Oh, oh lord. Um, but yeah, Matador, that feels very much like a... Kind of like a declaration of defiance. Oh, I can see that. Well, I suppose it's kind of the theme of just being a Matador in general. Mm. When they've written it, mm, when it's sung especially, it's within the chorus. It sounds like that. It's like, yeah, you are. You're the one there doing what you can and... Standing out and avoiding criticism, kind of, you know, we're kind of strange work. Mm. So here we are, put in a crappy situation that we probably, in theory, should get completely screwed over by, but we're going to prove you wrong. Mm. Uh, and then we have the last song, From the Dead. Which kind of fits Total Noise from the previous song. <laughs> yeah, and it feels quite perfect as a closing song. It kind of follows on from Matador. Yeah. You know, it continue, continues it onwards while it's kind of winding down a bit. The, um, yeah. It's in a bad way, when it's kind of wind down, it kind of thinks, oh, that was just kind of dissipated a bit. But here, it has enough power to sound awesome as an ending song. Yeah. But whilst also giving closure. Mm. I mean, that's the sort of thing you need from a closing song, is you either need an absolute explosion to just completely you know if you like blowing up the speakers so they're not playing anymore it'll just be an actually ending a fight club for speakers or, the film, at <laughs> or you need it to be a very powerful but at the same time calming song so you're sort of you're eased back into reality yeah, in fact, that kind of the main thing I'm talking about there reminds me quite a lot of uh, the ending song to Vertical by Culture Luna. Mm-hmm. That thing is incredibly heavy, most metal, inspired by Metropolis, the Latin British film. And then this ending song is mostly just synths and vocals and nothing else. It's like a pretty gigantic wall of sound for the last hour, so it just kind of drops down into almost nothing, with the, just the guy singing with some synths in the background. Mm. And it's like, oh, this is really, really calming. It's like kind of looking at the aftermath of a giant wave of destruction. Yeah. But it's one of those things that you need as a sort of... In a way, it makes it easier to listen to other music. Really, yeah, actually, I think, I think the way the album works very well, Solid Victor just kind of grabs you and brings you in, and then From the Dead just kind of lets you out the door after a good night out, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, come into the pub, we've got free booze. And then at the end, it's like, okay, last orders. Bye, guys. Get home safely. Yeah. Uh, Have a taxi if you want one. Yeah. 
that's actually a really good way of thinking about it. It is the sort of welcoming you in. And it's not sort of, get out of here. It's just, okay, we've all had our fun. Now let's... Time to go home to you tomorrow. Yeah. And, yeah, I think it really holds up. I mean, it's, we may say that there's a couple of iffy tracks on the album. It's kind of a case of the, you know, the weaker tracks, but only in comparison to the rest of the album. Yeah. So uh, they're bad for the album, but as actual songs, they're still really good. Yeah. I think you're definitely right that they'd be more memorable in their own right. It's just that when they're heard with the rest of the album, they kind of fade into the background a bit. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what would you rate it? So, Ooh, um, at least four, possibly four and a half if we're having half stars. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking sort of four, four and a half. I, I'm more leaning towards four, mainly because in the context of the album, Rise of the Fall and Black Friday are a bit less memorable, but it, it's one of those, the album will never go down, in my opinion. I can't. It's a very solid album, and I can see it lasting a long time. Yeah, it's one of those. It's a solid four, and there are songs on it that would be a solid five. Yeah, definitely. Kind of shame, for example. Yeah. Just up to me. Um, um, we've said what our favourites are. Um, that's pretty much it for this episode. Um, no idea when or what the next episode is going to be. Uh, deciding to do this all on a album by album case, you know. I mean, I decided to do a show on this album because it stood out to me. Hmm. Also, it's kind of a return to form of a band that's been absent for years. Yeah. And years and years and years. Yeah. And it's sort of like, I mean, considering their last album came out when we were like, what, eight, nine at <laughs> the most. Yeah, it's good to have them, you know, back. I reckon well, it's kind of proof that even now they can keep it up. Mm. Even with a huge absence, they still they've got the same kind of talent they had before. They can still provide solid music. Yeah, I think what does help is that three of the members are the original lineup. Of course, funnily enough, Mike Patton isn't actually part of the original lineup. He came in later, didn't he? And then kind of said, "This is my favorite." Yeah. Well, they'd been around for like seven years before Mike Patton had come along. Oh, well. Wow. And then um, John Hudson, he was around for the last couple of years and then came back for this reunification. So I think what definitely helps it is the fact that more or less the lineup is the original lineup. Very similar lineup, still proving very good. Yeah. One thing I have to add is the cover of the album creeps me out. Yeah, that cover. <laughs> I'm not sure what to make of that. Um, uh, <laughs> it's pretty creepy. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Um, not even sure how to describe it. I I wouldn't be surprised if it turns out that's Mike Patton on the front. <laughs> you say, yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. I was thinking about him not having, you know, basically a joke and not really having any reason to be embarrassed, but I can see him doing that. Yeah. And it's sort of, whoever it is, in an adult nappy. With, uh, is that a, it probably has some kind of symbolism to it, but I have no idea what. Yeah. Is that a bag or a turkey on his head? <laughs> I think it's a bag. <laughs> He's a sack. Could <laughs> be funny if it's a turkey, but I don't think it is. And he's in front of some stairs with a dog in the background. I don't get what the fuck it is. He's wearing shoes without socks. How horrifying. <laughs> so his knees look like old trees. Yeah. It's yeah. been lovely. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very peculiar cover. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's pretty much all we can say on the album. Aside from definitely pick it up if you get the chance. Do what you can. Pirate it, buy it, whatever you want to do. You can't decide what you do with it. But yeah. if, if you have some money lying around, you don't mind buying a CD, it's probably worth your money. Yeah, I mean, admittedly, I'm not sure if I should be admitting this, but oh well. I did acquire it through a leak, but... <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have it again, though. 
Yeah. 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 A lot of people do, well, especially people I know, seem to download things first, even if they're not legally out yet. Yeah. And then think, oh, I really like this, I'm actually going to go and buy it. Mm. And all the stuff I own and stuff I've downloaded previously, and thought, I like this, I'm going to buy it. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to buy it when I get the chance. So. I mean, it only came out on Tuesday, so... Yeah, so not long ago. Yeah. Which I haven't looked for it, but again, I didn't know exactly when it came out. Mm. And so I haven't been in town for this. Well, the only thing I've been in town for was going to the job centre, so it's, it was basically a case of, I just want to go back home. So you're looking for a job, but I you know, had the last six days working. Yeah. 40 hours. Ugh. Ugh. I've I have so many there. hours to Huh? I have so many hours to <laughs> I wouldn't complain. Yeah, I, I have a few spare lying around a bit what I do. <laughs> I, I finally got a day off, so. Yeah, which is why we're able to do this. Yeah. But anyway, enough of our rambling. That's <laughs> uh, goodbye from me. That's uh, goodbye from me too. Go listen to this album, it's really good. <laughs>